Well, good morning, everyone, and, and thank you to everyone from the Yukon community uh, near and far who are, who are joining us for this uh, second virtual town hall to answer questions on the university's response to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, as we did in the first town hall, the goal is to share with you up-to-date information as we have it uh, and answer any questions you might have. Um, I just want to remind you that this is one of three primary mechanisms you have to get information. I want to first of all direct you for the most up-to-date information at any time to go to the University COVID web website, which is accessible from the university homepage. In addition, uh, we are sending out brief summaries of what's going on in each specific area in an afternoon email blast to the entire community. So that's another way to stay up to date. And of course, the third way are these town halls. Uh, as, as I did last time, I have uh, some of our emergency response team leaders with me today. I want to introduce those up on stage, if we could pull back and, and show them here. First to my right is um, the leader of the Student Affairs Committee uh, of the Emergency Response Team, Dean of Students, uh, Ellie Dougherty. And uh, we are working on panning. We don't have the panning. Apparently, we don't have the panning. OK, I'll, I, I will just briefly introduce. We have Scott Jordan, our, our uh, EVP for Operations and, and Administration. We have Jeffrey Scholson, uh, the leader of the Academic Affairs Committee. Uh, we have Chris uh, DeLello, uh, head of HR for the staff uh, committee. And Nathan First is here on stage with me, um, our uh, head, of, head of enrollment. Uh, we have a few other leaders uh, in the audience to answer specific questions. Uh, I'll draw attention to Dr. Kevin Dekaus. Thank you for coming from UConn Health to answer uh, health-related questions. You know, we said uh, last week that we would uh, uh, update you as things change, and as you know, things have. There have been significant developments in the evolution of the spread of the, of the disease, as well as in the guidance that we've received uh, from the CDC and the governor's office. And as a result of that, we're in a new phase of response as a university. Uh, in, you know, in broad terms, I would summarize it this way. Last week, we were in a mode where we were concerned first with protecting uh, individual health and population health, and then continuing to the extent possible uh, our mission as much as we could. And we've kind of shifted into a phase which is to first of all protect individual and population health and reduce our mission uh, uh, as much as possible except for those critical activities. And so as a result of that, um, there have been some changes which you saw in my message to you last night, and I'll just recap briefly uh, what that message was. Um, first of all, based on the guidance from the governor's office and the CDC, all large gatherings are canceled until mid-May, which of course uh, uh, extends past graduation. So um, the first thing is we will be extending online instruction and our telecommuting uh, from the original deadline of April 6th to now to the end of the semester. And the second thing is unfortunately, we've had to cancel our plans for uh, graduation. And um, for, for that, I just want to make a brief comment to the class of 2020, uh, just share with you uh, uh, that my, my sorrow that um, I know this is not the way you expected your senior year to end. And, uh, and I'm truly sorry that I won't be able to share the stage with you and celebrate with you uh, your final year and my first graduation ceremony at, at UConn. Uh, but we are committed to bring you back at a safe and appropriate time uh, to celebrate you in the way that you deserve. And so we'll do all that we can with, uh, to do that. Um, okay. Um, the, other, the other shift is uh, in terms of staffing. We're, we're, we're shifting to uh, trying to have non-critical staff go home as much as possible. So. That's a, that's a shift from last time where we tried to have as staff as much as possible telecommute and those who couldn't to come in 
and now it's, it's basically uh, to work with your supervisors and uh, for, for those non-critical uh, to, to, um, to go home. A uh, little update on the status at each of our campuses. Uh, Stanford is basically, for all in intents and purposes, closed. There are a few students left in the dorms who had no place to go, and those, those students are still there. Um, the regionals and stores are, are in a similar uh, situation where it's limited operations. We have, a, over a spring break, a couple thousand students in the dorms, and we'll be uh, reducing that to a, a thousand plus uh, over the coming weeks. Um, research is ramping down. Um, essentially, uh, the, there's an emphasis on working from home uh, and giving agency to individuals uh, to make, make choices while maintaining essential services needed for, for um, critical research, including um, uh, human treatments that need to continue, uh, animals that need to be cared for, and so on. Uh, and then there are people doing research on um, uh, COVID uh, therapies and vaccines, and of course we'd like that to continue. So that's the shift there. Um, at uh, UConn Health, uh, there's a shift in focus uh, to shift resources towards emergent care, and uh, so some things like uh, elective surgeries have been uh, canceled and some outpatient facilities have been re redirected so that we're um, prepared for um, handling uh, urgent care in response to the COVID crisis. Um, there's a, a, a new announcement from UConn Health that I'd like to share with you is that they've created a new hotline, uh, UConn, uh, a UConn Health COVID call center that will take uh, health questions from anyone whether they're at UConn Health or not. Anyone in the university community that has a health question related to COVID can call this number and it will be posted on our website, but it's 860-679-3199. I want to, to celebrate and thank uh, the members of our community who are doing heroic work, uh, particularly the healthcare workers who put themselves on the line every day uh, for the sake of others. Uh, but are also our faculty and staff for cr supporting the critical needs of, of students. Uh, and also I'd like to thank those who are here uh, from the, well, whether they're here or not, I'd like to thank the emergency response team, many of whom have been working round the clock uh, to uh, support the university in this crisis. I'm really proud of the university and the way it has responded uh, to this unprecedented challenge. Uh, it has been flexible, it has been resilient, and it has been remarkably mutually, mutually supportive. I'm proud of our faculty and students who have pivoted to uh, online learning, and uh, I've, I've watched as faculty have uh, been exchanging emails with each other on uh, supports and pedagogies that they've tried, what's worked, what hasn't worked, providing help and guidance for each other. Uh, I am proud of the faculty who have pivoted their research. We have faculty in uh, the, the uh, College of Agriculture, Human and Natural Resources, I'm wearing one of their ties right now, my cow tie, uh, who have pivoted their research from the Vaccine Center to work on research related to a COVID vaccine. Uh, we have faculty in pharmacy who have pivoted their research to work on therapeutics uh, for COVID-19. Uh, this is what a great university does in responding uh, uh, to a societal need. Um, in addition, I'm proud of the response of the provost office and, and uh, faculty they're working with to create a one credit course on a title something along the lines of responding to a global crisis, which will bring uh, to bear the, res uh, the perspectives of scholars from across the disciplines, ranging from business to policy uh, uh, to health to uh, look at the responses, uh, complex interdependent responses to a global crisis such as this and, and really address the need that we all have uh, to understand what's going on in this unprecedented situation and also to draw on the lessons of history. As it turns out, we have one of the world's scholars 
on uh, the plague in the 14th century. Not that, that this is the same, but there are lessons to be drawn uh, of, from what's similar and what's different. So with that, I will now turn, turn it open to questions. I, I, we have our Vice President of Communications, Tyson Kendig here, who has received a number of questions over uh, the past day. And I, I think there have been over, there are several dozen unique questions, I understand. And in addition, we'll be taking live questions. I'll be essentially farming most of those out to uh, the leaders of the emergency response team. But let's go ahead and get started with those. Tyson. Thank you, President Katsalaeus. The largest number of questions we've received in advance and continue to receive, as you might expect, are about finance and refunds in particular. So in a nutshell, will students receive a partial refund on tuition, housing, meals, parking, and other fees with the campus closing for the semester? Yeah, I, certainly there will be some partial refunds. That Just preface this by saying that that our priority has been to focus on health and, and safety. At the same time, we're trying to work in the background with state agencies and even federal um, leaders and agencies uh, to um, identify resources that we can use to, to refund individuals. We don't know yet uh, how much of those we'll obtain and then ultimately what resources we can free up from the university. And that, that is a decision that requires input from the Board of Trustees and so that will, I, I expect to have more information on that after the Board of Trustees has its next meeting, which is March 25th. Uh, in the meantime, I can just share the philosophy is, to the extent possible, we would like to refund uh, as much as we can, all, if not all, at least part of, of uh, what's, been, uh, what's been paid. When are students going to be able to return to their dorms to retrieve items? What about campus apartments? Yeah, so, Come on up, um, call on our uh, Dean of Students, Ellie Doherty. They've thought carefully about how to do this safely and I'll turn it over to her to, to give the answer to the question. Yes, thank you. So first, let me say you can anticipate very detailed responses from Residential Life on how this will happen. And those responses will be sent to Residential Life uh, residents on campus, all 12,000, within the next several days. But a few things I want you to know now to keep in mind before you receive that message. First, students currently living on campus for spring break are able to move out as soon as tomorrow. And there will be messaging from Residential Life on how to turn in your keys. We're going to extend that period through Tuesday. So students currently living on campus who are able to move out immediately can do so starting tomorrow. Then, for the remaining students who have not moved out, we will be creating what will be a protracted move out period. So when you came to campus, when we welcomed you in the fall, you were able to sign up for a time and then we rotated you through to get to your residence hall safely and without overburdening the system. The same will happen this time, but because we need to follow the governor's guidance on how many people can be in a setting, what was a two day move, out, move in is now gonna be about a two week move out. And that will likely happen the end of March, the beginning of April, but what will be familiar to you is the ability to select a time. We're gonna give you a little more time to move out because we will have less resources available to support you. And what I mean by that is we won't have Husky haulers welcoming you. Uh, so we wanna make sure you have more time for that move out. We also want you to bring your own equipment to move things out since things like trolleys will be in short supply. So students currently living on campus can move out starting tomorrow through Tuesday. Then residential life will have a protracted move out period that will likely last about two weeks, but will be familiar to you, where you can select a move out time and we will follow that schedule um, in accordance with the governor's guidance. Thank you, Ellie. Mm -hmm. For students who live in Stanford campus housing, when do those students need to move out by? And perhaps related to that, a question that just came in is, do we have a sense of when UConn Stanford will reopen? 
that question. So UConn Stanford and UConn stores work together in their residential planning. So they will have a similar schedule and approach to move out, less students involved, but we'll have the Stanford students who are currently living there for spring break will be able to move out starting tomorrow. And then the Stanford students who are away from the residential buildings right now will be presented with move out options. Can international students still live in the dorm for the rest of the semester? So one of the things that is so important for me to share with all of you, that despite these changing times, we need to be a home for students who can't go home. And our international students are one of the biggest examples of that. And so, of course, for international students who don't have a home that's close to UConn stores, we will offer you extended housing on campus. We know who you are because you told us. So when we reached out to you and said, do you wanna stay on campus during the time that we're offering online learning? Those are the students that we know of and those are the students that we will provide housing to through the end of the semester. There are more students that we need to support beyond the international population, more students who ask to stay on campus beyond the international population. And all students will know the answer to that question later this afternoon around 3 p.m. Can you stay, can, can I interrupt for one second? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'd like to go, while Ellie's here, go back to a question that was asked at the last town hall that we didn't really have a good answer for and now we do. So the question was asked, what about students who don't have a laptop or connectivity to work online. At the, time, at the time, we didn't really have a solution for those students other than to stay in the dorm, and now we do have uh, some alternatives for them. I don't know yeah. if you want to just mention what that is. There are a number of providers who have now offered free Wi-Fi service to students, and we will be sharing that information through the ResLife messaging that will be happening later today, and I believe we've made that available to um, the Central University FAQ as well. And loaner laptops if necessary. So combination of the, the hardware and the connectivity. A question that just came in, what about RAs? Do they move out now? Do they help with the move out process? We want RAs to be home safe with their families. And so the residential life operation through the full-time staff that we have on campus will be managed through that staff. Our RAs are able to return home and they will do so through the move out process that we'll be articulating to students. Certainly RAs currently in residence on campus um, can move out this week. We have a few questions of an academic nature from students and parents. Thank you, Ellie. Mm -hmm. If current trends continue, will courses in summer sessions be affected? Now call on Jeffrey Schulson. So our, our primary focus up until now has largely been on the current semester to ensure that we have as many uh, support systems in place to be sure that we can support the courses that are being offered. But we have started to talk about summer session. Uh, we do know that over 70% of our summer offerings are already uh, online courses, and we don't expect those to be disrupted at all. Uh, but we are still considering what we will be, what, what the impact of the, the this event will be on those courses that are not yet um, themselves online courses, and whether we will move to virtual for those as well. Is it possible that international students cannot come back for the fall semester? Uh, okay, I'll call on Yuhang from our international student office. Thank you, Yuhang. Thank you. Um, international student scholars are an integral part of higher education in America. Talent is very important. Um, so we will continue to welcome international students, no matter whether you're exchange students or matriculating degree-seeking students. Pending the university's fall operation continues as normal, you're welcome to come back as normal. Um, but there might be entry restrictions imposed by various governments, and we'll do our best to provide you with such information, and we'll also advise you to keep aware about your home country's restrictions if there's any, if you decide to go home during the summer. If you decide to stay in the summer, the universities will have all kinds of options for you, to, for you to continue your study as well. Are grades going to be turned into pass-fail this semester? There's been a lot of discussion about this. So there is a current resolution being considered by the Senate, uh, and the vote will be completed this afternoon. 
about uh, loosening up restrictions on pass-fail courses. It's really the purview of the Senate to make that initial uh, statement. Once that resolution passes, as we expect it probably will, it will then be up to the departments and programs to make the determination about whether they want to shift some, of, some or all of their courses to pass-fail. Um, the restrictions that the Senate are loosening up will be what, whether courses can be used uh, towards general ed requirements or towards the major that, are, that have become pass-fail. But those determinations will be done program by program. And to clarify, we're talking about the University Senate making those. That's right, the University Senate. Should we contact the dean of the school regarding direct questions about performing arts classes that will not be able to continue the rest of the semester, such as orchestra and symphonic band? Yes, that's, that's a good suggestion, to contact the, the dean of the School of Fine Arts or the program directors. Uh, we are having uh, conversations about many of these kinds of courses, courses that we call performance-based courses. That include things like labs, studio art, the kinds of courses that don't necessarily obviously lend themselves to a virtual environment. There are many creative solutions that are out there. Uh, we've been encouraged by some of the conversations that are going on at the local level, but because these are often discipline specific, there's not one single answer for any of these courses. They really are courses, uh, questions that can be best directed uh, to the deans, to the department heads, to the uh, directors of these various programs and instructors. Yeah, I would, I would start with your instructor uh, and, and go from there if you don't get the answer you need. Will any support services, such as the Q Center and Writing Center, be available online? They're so popular. Yeah, Jeffrey. stay up here. Uh, I, I'm happy to say that we, we expect all of those services to be, services to be available uh, online and virtual. Uh, the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning, headed by Peter Diplock, has been doing, uh, the president used the word heroic before, and I will echo that, her an heroic job in developing resources and support systems for our instructors as well as for the students. There is already a site up at the CETL website called Keep Teaching. We expect by this afternoon that a, sec a parallel site will be available for students called Keep Learning. And on that site, there will be uh, information about accessing things like the W Center and the Q Center online. Will remote mental health services be available for students? The answer is yes. For both uh, medical and mental health care, we're gonna start changing how we deliver care, but the care remains. And what I wanna say more specifically is those areas would prefer a phone call in, and then we will create telemedicine means for us to interact with you. And certainly our counseling providers will be offering that to our students who need our care. Will class housing selection times for 2020-2021 be affected? We're going to postpone scheduling for housing selection, uh, but not too far. We'll be notifying you later in the week about that with when specifically that will be happening, but I'm sure you can understand that I'm asking the staff to prioritize right now, providing housing for students who need it, who can't leave, and then arranging a safe move out process for everyone. Are all commencement exercises canceled, including UConn Health graduates? Is it possible for individual schools and colleges to reschedule ceremonies depending on how things change going forward? Yeah, um, right now the guidance from the governor and CDC is there can be no large gatherings before May 15th. So essentially, even satellite um, uh, ceremonies have to be canceled. In terms of rescheduling, it just seems premature right now, uh, given the uncertainties. It may become possible later to, to reschedule, but, but trying to consider whether to do that now seems quite premature. I think our provost would like to make a comment on that. Let's see how we can get out of your way here. All of that is true about physical coming together, but it wow. is the case that a number of units are thinking about ways to virtually engage their communities, and we're encouraging that. If there are ways to celebrate the reality, that should happen. Secondly, it's also important to realize that graduation includes two things. One is the coming together and celebration. The other is the conferral of degrees. Conferral of degrees is being managed and will handle in the normal course, and therefore anyone who needs their degree granted will have that degree granted. Thank you. What is going to happen with books that have been rented from the library? So Dean Langley, at the, uh, who's the dean of the library, has, has informed me that they are uh, advising all people who have books out of the library to hold on to them. 
uh, and there will be no uh, imposition of fines for overdue books or anything like that. Um, and there will be a protocol eventually in place for the returning of those books. And once that has been established, it will be posted on the library's website. How will returning books to the Yukon Bookstore and getting refunds for commencement regalia work? Uh, Scott is about returning books and regalia. Yeah, we, we are working with uh, Barnes & Noble, our bookstore partner, on uh, uh, refund policy, um, regalia return, and a whole host of issues. And, and as, as those get resolved, we'll be uh, posting them to the website. We have a few questions about student employment and funding. What is happening with employment for those who have lost on-campus jobs? Will there be additional financial aid for students who depend on their campus jobs? And should students seek employment elsewhere? You want to make some general remarks? Or you got it. Okay, sure. Go ahead. So um, yeah. uh, there is uh, assistance available for any student facing financial hardship through our financial aid office. And uh, students can reach out to our resources that we have uh, available there as they're always available. Uh, for student employment, it's up to the supervisor's discretion as to how they want to pay out uh, student labor wages, be it work study or student labor, uh, for the remainder of the semester. Is graduate student funding going to be affected before or after everything returns to normal? Graduate students who are funded as teaching assistants will continue to be paid because they're continuing to instruct, though virtually. Uh, graduate students who are gra on graduate assistantships as research assistants, that will be a little bit um, more nuanced and case by case. It depends uh, largely on the source of the funding. Uh, we're getting, we're collecting information from the various funding sources, the various federal agencies and other agencies about how uh, to be uh, using the various funds to, to pay for instruction and to pay for the work that's getting done. Uh, so that's going to be handled on a more case-by-case -case basis. I'll just add that, that the, um, uh, the agencies have, the federal funding agencies, NIH, NSF, have been uh, indicating that they will be flexible in terms of um, that kind of support. So it is case-by-case. -case. Each faculty member has to consult with their program manager for guidance from them. But the agencies have indicated that they will uh, forgive uh, delays in deliverables on research. Um, there, obviously, there's a lot of research that can be done uh, from home, telecommuting. So if, you're, if you've got data that you need to write up, you can be working at home, writing up the data, perhaps even reading technical papers. Uh, but it, but um, you know, as Jeffrey said, it, it is case by case. But I would expect the overwhelming number of cases to be that, yes, you can continue to do your research um, and, and have the agency to decide whether to do it from whether it's from home or or um, you need to come into the lab. Does the university have any update or guidance on internships and whether students should still be going to them? So I can answer this and also address uh, other related questions of having to do with largely experiential offsite. Um, uh, learning experiences. We have lots of clinical placement programs, lots of field instruction programs, uh, and we're hearing almost uh, almost universally it hasn't been completely shut down. But for the most part, these kinds of opportunities are being uh, shut down in the con in this context. And so individual programs are working on solutions for their students in order to be able to uh, address those needs. When it comes to internships. Um, the best source of information is going to be the supervisor of the internship and the location where your internship is being held. Um, we expect that many of those places will ask you not to come in. Um, and you should then be in contact with your supervisor to talk about alternative arrangements, ways of, of getting credit for the work you're doing in different forms. We have a number of questions pertaining to faculty and staff and the delivery of courses online. Has the university considered pausing the delivery of classes for an additional week beyond spring break? Um, our provost, uh, John Elliott, is coming up. I, I just say that there's been a lot of discussion about this. And um, you know, some of our peers have uh, extended spring break by a week. And some of our peers have gone online with only three days notice. So there's a, there's a range. And it's a struggle between um, upholding the flexibility that our faculty need and the continuity that our students need. 
I think uh, Provost might, might have further comments on that, but I, at this point, we are um, going to start online classes on Monday. That's almost two weeks from when we first notified faculty uh, to be ready, and I think most of our faculty will be ready by that time. If faculty are not ready, and I, we understand that some faculty have specific circumstances that perhaps they have burdens of, of uh, home, home care for either children or elderly and, and uh, are unable to prepare during this week, they should go to their department chairs uh, just as they would if, if there was an issue uh, during a regular session uh, with their ability to deliver their course, course lecture and the department chair will work with them towards a solution. I don't know if, our, if you have anything to add to that. I agree. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, our provost endorses that. For students who live in a different time zone, are they expected to participate or tune in during the time their class would normally meet, or are lectures going to be recorded? Uh, we are allowing uh, instructors to determine whether they want their course delivery to be synchronous or asynchronous, which is to say, um, all meeting at the same time or allowing uh, folks to access the, the, the course materials uh, on their own time. So that's going to be a, a question that would be best addressed to the individual instructors. We've encouraged the instructors to be in direct contact with students as soon as possible to let them know what they're thinking, what their plans are, but that's going to happen uh, at the course level. How is the university transitioning professors to teach classes online? What kind of help is available to instructors that aren't tech savvy or used to using things like Husky CT, WebEx, et cetera? So I've already mentioned the heroic efforts of Peter Diplock and his team at CETL. Uh, it can't be mentioned enough. They've really done an enormous uh, uh, job in, in taking on this task and providing the support for our faculty. Um, there are many resources now posted at the CETL website uh, with lots of questions that are answered directly there, but the CETL has also been offering an array of different work, virtual workshops. I believe the number is well over 600 at this point. Uh, in addition to uh, individual consultations, faculty who are having specific challenges are, are encouraged to contact CETL directly, uh, and they should be getting a response pretty quickly. Um, I've been hearing in, anecdotally from my colleagues in the various departments that they have been really, really pleased with the support that they've been getting from CETL. Uh, they have been an, an incredibly helpful resource. Uh, we understand that this is new territory for many of our colleagues and things are not going to be perfect from the very start. It's about um, working with your students and working with your colleagues to come up with, uh, with solutions that are especially helpful. One place where we found a lot of help has been coming forward, coming from, has been within the departments themselves. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about terrific communities of pedagogical innovation and experimentation emerging within the departments, um, departmental conversations happening online, sharing ideas, sharing success suggestions. Uh, your colleagues are often your best place to get help because some of them have solved the problems that you're still trying to figure out how to solve. Uh, it's also the case that we know lots of professional associations out there are providing resources uh, and it might be worth having a look at what your professional associations are offering as well as other options for some, some of the virtual instruction that you'll be doing. You know, it's where it, I just want to comment anecdotally uh, that, you, you know, what you said about chat rooms going on within departments. As a, as a member of the physics department, uh, I, I listen in on the chat that's going on, and it, it's quite interesting. There are some tech-savvy faculty who have very sophisticated online delivery pedagogy, but there are some other faculty who have experimented with really basic uh, right. solutions that work extremely well. So the one that I, I found most entertaining was there was a group of faculty that shared that they had stacked up a stack of books and placed their, cam their cell phone camera on top of the books facing down at their Are we back on or not yet? How long ago did we go down? Just a few seconds, okay. Okay. Right. Okay, I'm sorry, we had a little bit of a technical uh, problem there, so we're going to go back to that question. Yes, I'll, re I'll repeat the question uh, for those who did not hear it. Are there any updates on the status of non-critical employees that have to physically report to work that are unable to telecommute during this time? 
Yes, and as I, I mentioned, um, when we developed our initial approach, we chose to address and ask those employees who could telecommute to do so, and we recognized there were a group of employees that couldn't telecommute and had to remain on campus and at their workstation. Um, as Tom mentioned at the beginning, um, we are now shifting our approach. Um, we are working or will be working with the leaders of our union colleagues. Um, and the approach uh, as that we're moving toward is to take those who haven't been able to telecommute and break down the organization into those uh, functions that are mission critical and um, those um, that can't be done. And um, as we work through that, we are going to be extremely respectful of state guidance um, for those people who have secondary contact and child care issues. Related to the first question of this town hall, do employees have to continue to pay for parking while telecommuting? Um, this is Scott. I will defer to Scott Jordan. <laughs> Times like that, you're happy to be in HR and yeah. not in uh, exactly. the finance uh, office. Uh, similar to our, the answer to our first question, this has a, um, a financial and policy impact on the university, and we're working, we're looking at it now, uh, and should be able to get an answer uh, back to you uh, uh, shortly. We have several questions from our prospective student community. How will admitted UConn students get to tour the campus? So our admissions and our Lodwick Visitor Center team is actively working on putting up a virtual tour as we speak. It should be available early next week. How will this situation affect applicants and the May 1st decision deadline? Um, at this point in time, it's a little too early for us to consider changing the May 1 deadline. It's just worth noting that our regional campus deposit deadline is June 1 um, by design. Will the UConn Bound Day be rescheduled? If so, when? Or will it become a virtual admitted students day instead? We're also working to push the UConn Bound Day to a virtual experience. Um, and at such time that uh, uh, it becomes uh, uh, able for us to have in-person events, we'll recommence with those. Will there still be summer orientation? There will be summer orientation, but our orientation team is also working on plans to be ready to deliver that in a virtual way. Will this affect or delay transfer decision notifications? Uh, transfer decision notifications along with credit evaluations continue as scheduled. With SATs being canceled, is that still a requirement UConn will have to be admitted? Uh, for those students that are applying late or applying to our regional campuses, we will have some alternatives available for students um, such that we could waive them. But for the most part, uh, applicants for the entering class for the fall have already submitted their test scores and those have been received and evaluated. And one last question in this realm, are graduate school applications still being reviewed in the midst of all of this? Yes. A couple health-related questions specifically. Great. We're going to call on Dr. Kevin Dekaus to come up. Given the lack of available testing in the state of Connecticut, are there plans to develop on-site testing at UConn and at UConn Health? Great question. So yes. Um, actually, DPH is coming tomorrow to, to uh, look at our testing site. This will be a uh, drive-through testing site uh, in lot three. Uh, this will be phased out. Um, initially, it is going to be restricted to patients who are established at UConn Health uh, or faculty and employees of the health center. Uh, in the meantime, we are working with partners uh, regionally uh, and facilitating testing through other test sites such as uh, Bristol Hospital, Hartford Health, uh, St. Francis, and Waterbury. Has UConn Health been approved as a COVID-19 testing site, and how would that testing work? Is it exclusively drive-ups? Uh, so, as I said with the last question, uh, we will hopefully on Friday, uh, assuming we have DPH approval, have a, a drive-up testing site uh, that will be approved. Uh, this will phase out over the next couple of weeks, and we are working with partners in the region. How is UConn Health keeping potential COVID-19 patients away from other patients? Sure. So we've had uh, implemented several policies for safety, both safety of our patients as well as uh, our staff and employees. Uh, first of all, everybody who enters the building uh, is screened. Uh, patients are screened with questions as well as temperature scans. Uh, effective today, all staff and employees are also screened with temperature before entering the building. 
uh, as patients are coming in and if they have symptoms, they're segregated into a separate area, and I think we talked about that with the last town meeting uh, to keep uh, patients and staff safe. Does UConn Health have the bandwidth to deal with an influx of COVID-19 patients? So we are actively working on uh, emergency preparation plans, um, identifying uh, locations uh, for patient care, uh, as well as freeing up uh, non-essential services. So outpatient uh, visits have been uh, rescheduled, uh, surgeries have been uh, canceled, uh, and that frees up human resources as well as uh, physical space. So we're actively working on those plans. If a faculty or staff member gets COVID-19, who do they need to tell at the university? Uh, so there's a chain of command for this. Uh, they should first of all tell their supervisor, but we have an um, uh, internal uh, number uh, to human resources and we have uh, protocols in place for managing these cases. Will student find that number on the COVID website? Yes, so, the, uh, so UConn Health employees will have that number available to them on the COVID website. Will student health services on campus remain open? Yep. Short answer is yes, but I think Ellie will have more. Uh, it will remain open, and certainly I'll look to my colleague, Crystalello, for confirmation, but non-UConn health employees, so UConn campus employees would want to tell their supervisors as well. Any unique directions for UConn, non-UConn health? Who they should? No. Yep, so work directly with managers in those resources. And as mentioned earlier, student health is an essential function for us and we'll continue to provide care for our students. Uh, however, through a virtual format primarily and then person to person as recommended by our doctors. Does the university know what will happen with student clinical placements? So as I mentioned before, there is a group that is discussing these issues, but uh, it really is uh, not one, there's not one single answer to this. Every clinical program has its own uh, requirements, its own accrediting expectations. Um, each of these clinical programs is in contact with its accrediting body to find out what kinds of directions they're getting from those accrediting bodies, uh, to determine what kind of flexibility there may be in those accrediting processes. Uh, we've learned that many of these clinical programs have already built in a degree of ex additional requirements that are not actually required by the accrediting bodies, and so that does give some degree of flexibility and movement within those programs. But these are questions that are best addressed ind individually by each of the programs and program directors. The federal government does not allow a refund for canceled flights. How would travelers be refunded for canceled travel plans using federal grants? Well, just in, in brief, we're, we're trying to work with the federal agencies right now to allow those reimbursements to take place. But if they don't, uh, our, our position right now is we will hold harmless our faculty who are disrupted in that way. Should graduate students plan to cancel domestic and international research travel over the summer? Good question. In thinking about summer travel, uh, whether it's for graduate students or for faculty, uh, our guidance is that if you plan to make any kind of arrangements for travel, you should be sure to make them in a way that can allow for the greatest flexibility or, or cancellation. No one knows where we're going with this and what the status of situation is going to be come June, July, or August. It may be that that, that that travel will be possible, but it's also very likely that it will not be possible, and we want you to be able to get the refund or exchange that, that you can get. What are the updated recommendations and or mandates on how to proceed with human subjects research? For example, a researcher plans to resume a study that has between one and five participants in a research lab for roughly 30 minutes. Should data collection be postponed amidst the new information and precautions being implemented? So we have our associate uh, BPR, Michelle Williams, will be coming up, but uh, basically the guidance is any, any research that can, human subject for research that can be postponed should be postponed. So the things that cannot be postponed, such as human subjects who are receiving treatments or, or need to be monitored at a certain time in a treatment uh, uh, plan, that will take place. But anything else should be postponed. Um, is, that, is that about it? OK. Thank you, Michelle. It's pretty simple. Are there any implications for staff on an H-1B visa at this time? Back. 
I just have consulted with our general counsel's office. In general, if you continue to do the same work as you're doing and living uh, within commuting distance in case of emergencies you need to report to campus, you should be fine. But for some reason, if you stopped working and uh, then you're good for 30 days, and under those circumstances, I would suggest you consult with the general counsel's office on a case-by-case -case basis. As time goes by, when the federal government releases more guidelines, the general counsel's office will also provide further gu guidelines individually or as a group to those faculty and staff. Thank you, Your Honor. What level of bus service will continue to be provided, if any? Good question. Yep. Scott Jordan. Um, at the Stores campus, uh, bus service will continue on a weekend uh, schedule. So that's a, so the weekend schedule during the week, meaning that's right, it's, it's slightly it's reduced, but still functioning. That's, yes, that's right. So it'll, it'll, it will run seven days a week, but on the weekend schedule. Thank you. At this time, are construction projects on campus proceeding as planned, given the most recent mm -hmm. guidelines? If a case of COVID-19 is discovered in a construction worker, would that specific project be shut down or would all projects be shut down? Um, University Planning, Design, and Construction is working with all of our contractors uh, on campus to ensure that uh, those contractors are following CDC uh, and OSHA guidelines around first maintaining uh, safety on our job sites and maintaining uh, uh, continuity. Uh, we are... Uh, 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 committed to ensuring uh, that if if a contractor uh, uh, has uh, uh, COVID-19 on their job site and employees have to stay home, uh, that that job site will be uh, shut down uh, at the moment when the job cannot continue safely. I believe this next question is partially covered by the guidance on large gatherings, but what will happen to the Connecticut Repertory Theater shows? Are they canceled or just postponed? Yeah. Well, let's see. They certainly all all dates that are between now and and May mid May are are canceled. Uh, I don't know on the individual I, the answer whether they're they're planning to reschedule those after. I'm not sure anyone has that answer hand, handy, but I, I suspect that they're they're just canceled, subject to further notice at this point. Employees are about to begin the evaluation period for professional staff in the UCP union. What is the plan for adjusting to our current circumstances? Our colleagues who are members of the UCP union um, faced a postponement of their performance evaluation training um, as we worked through this initial response as a university. But I can tell you um, everything will be moving online. Um, effective on March 25th at 9 a.m. Um, that training will commence through WebEx and you should refer to Daily Digest for more information about that. The evaluations um, right now um, continue as originally timed. What is the current status with dining services and dining services staff? Jordan? Um, University of Dining Services is open in a limited capacity to serve the students uh, that are still on campus. Um, with regard to Dining Services staff, uh, they are represented by the Unite Here uh, Union and Dining Services Management is working uh, with the union on a uh, reduction in staff to meet our current needs. This question is based on some recent news reports. Is UConn able to use dorms as medical facilities? The quick answer is not really, uh, because they're not medical facilities. We do have within our infirmary the capacity to isolate a student if need be temporarily before we transport to more extensive medical care. 
And we will have the ability within our residence halls after the move out of students is complete for us to quarantine students if we need to do so. But beyond that, our ability is limited and we'd be reliant on medical providers within the state. Those relationships are already in place through the strong staff that we have at Student Health under Dr. Era and Tina McCarthy's leadership. And we're prepared for that. And our plans for the remainder of the semester will allow us to provide that type of medical care to our students should COVID come to campus. You know, there, there's, a, there's a broader community here than just our faculty, staff, and students, and I want to acknowledge them. I, you know, I mentioned how proud I am of, of the whole community and how it's responding. Yesterday, I learned from one of our Board of Trustees, uh, Chuck Bunnell, who runs a large hotel chain, that uh, he has reached out to the governor's office to make his, ho his ho hotel, which is shut down, available uh, for, um, for, for taking overloads on patients, for isolation, for anything that can be helpful uh, to the state in this time of crisis. It just makes you proud to be mm -hmm. part, of, part of UConn's broader Husky Nation. And, um, not only the hotel, but the infrastructure that's available. So he's made all of that available. Question pertaining to research. Will the university provide a more specific definition of essential functions as they relate to research lab activity? I think there, there's more information on uh, the website there's, the, that's been provided by the VPR's office. And then, of course, there may be some things that will be case by case that the VPR's office is more than happy to handle. Is, is, I'm going to introduce Michelle Williams, our Associate Vice President for Research. So I think the, the best way for faculty to begin thinking about what is an essential function is start from the framework of the CDC guidelines on reducing risk and uh, reducing the number of individuals who are going to be working in research spaces. So that should be the guiding principle of what constitutes essential uh, health and safety and the welfare of the individuals who are going to have to be in physical contact with each other. Uh, those research projects that require human interaction, uh, as the President mentioned, uh, only in those cases where there is direct therapeutic value or therapeutic um, uh, stopping or halting that research may pro uh, pose some type of risk for the, the individuals, those research projects can continue. In-person interactions that do not require therapeutic benefit or or animal research in that case, that uh, stopping that research might in fact uh, create some type of harm or pain to those animals. Those are really going to be the, the kinds of research projects as we ramp down that can continue. But even in those instances, the priority still should be placed on using the CDC guidance. The expectation should be that those are going to be activities that take place with minimal staff but that the work must be conducted safely and competently, and if that cannot be done, then those research projects should be paused or halted. Thank you, Michelle. We have time for just a couple more questions, and we've been getting several pertaining to commencement. In the President's email, he said the class of 2020 would be invited to return at some future date in lieu of commencement to celebrate their accomplishments. What are some possibilities being tossed around? You know, the, the one that, that's been tossed around is um, reunion weekend. So um, that has a certain appeal because essentially it's, it, it is, um, you, you will be alumni at that point and uh, we could come back and celebrate you. The other alums could celebrate you as uh, the most recent graduates. We could have a separate graduation ceremony conceivably uh, before, before or after uh, the reunion weekend football game. and. One of the things that's appealing to me about this suggestion is uh, we could have it at Rensselaer Field and for the first time have the entire university at the same ceremony, um, which would be pretty fabulous. So that's, that's just one idea. And then as the provost mentioned, there are, you know, in, in the meantime, uh, you know, sort of uh, virtual uh, celebrations and options that are being explored as a, a placeholder until we can do something like that. Another popular question that has come in in different forms during the broadcast, should students try to exchange their graduation regalia or hold on to it for some future date? I, I think hold on to it, right? The, uh, um, we have our uh, head of special events, Kara, Kara Workman, is that right? Yes, so actually the anyone that has pre-ordered regalia will be receiving an email from uh, the entity that they ordered their regalia and they will make arrangements to refund the regalia. 
and, and that applies for faculty and staff as well as any graduates. If you wish to keep your regalia, you are welcome to keep your regalia. Okay, thank you. How are students in honors able to submit a copy of their thesis to ensure they graduate with the honors distinction? The current guideline states that a copy should be submitted in person. So uh, we're clearly not expecting that they be submitted in person. Uh, the, the, the best thing to do would be to contact directly the director of the honors program, uh, Jen Lise Butts, who can um, provide guidance for how to submit. But uh, I'm sure that there are, uh, there, are, uh, there are arrangements being made to have those sort of submissions being done online. And one final question to close with. How is Jonathan the 14th doing? Oof. I'm so glad you asked. He's doing great. I hear uh, additional treats are being handed out. <laughs> and um, I've asked Jonathan, presuming it's healthy for everyone on campus, if he would be willing to visit the residence halls with me after everyone's moved out so we can just say hi and thank you so much to those students who are finding a home at UConn. But just so you know how he's doing today, this is what he was up to. Can we That's zoom in? No, well, we don't have here is a very cute picture of Jonathan in a sort of post snowy day, enjoying spring and thanking all of you for reaching out to. And I believe his Twitter handle is gonna remain active. So we'll keep you posted on how Jonathan is doing. And one of the things Jonathan's doing in that photo is getting outdoors and fresh air yes. it, during the daytime. There is no better, safer place for you to be. Uh, the virus is very photosensitive in the ultraviolet light. Uh, there, the air there is uh, as good as it can get as long as you uh, maintain your social distance. There's, there's no better way. So with that, let me just say thank you, everyone. Uh, really appreciate the entire community's flexibility and cooperation. Uh, working together like this is the best path for us to get successfully to the, the backside of this crisis, to get on the other side uh, as quickly and, and safely as we can by taking these uh, rather disruptive steps now. So thank you for co your cooperation with those steps and stay well and, uh, and stay safe. Thank you.